My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the proud co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Bonnie halpern felcher who will be talking to you about teen misconceptions about e-cigs, nicotine, and flavored vapes. What should parents know? Take it away, Bonnie. Great. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and so happy to, well, I can't see you, but so happy to have you all here. I'm going to go ahead and get started as as well was said by Charlene, please do put questions in the in the uh, Q&A and I will uh, either answer as we go or more likely at the end. Also, as I go along, I like to do some pop quizzes for you uh, where you put some information into the chat yourself. So if you would play along, it makes it a lot more fun since we are on Zoom and we're not able to interact in the same way. So I am a developmental psychologist and uh, with additional training in adolescent young adult health. And so I'm going to give you a lens around adolescent tobacco use and particularly focused on vaping or e-cigarette use. I do always need to give a couple of quick disclosures. One, as Charlene mentioned, I am an expert in some city, state, and federal level policies. I'm also an expert scientist in some litigation against some e-cigarette companies probably figure out which ones. I always like to give a special shout out to our funders. And I just would like to pause on my team just to give a huge shout out to my REACH lab. REACH stands for Research and Education to Empower Adolescents and Young Adults to Choose Health. We not only do research on adolescent e-cigarette or nicotine use, tobacco overall, cannabis, but on all areas of adolescent risk behavior. And I'm super excited to be supported in my lab by researchers, educators, a public health lawyer, a graphic designer, an adolescent medicine physician, and a psychiatrist. We also work a lot with our youth uh, our Stanford Youth Action Board, or YAB, we have, they're not all pictured here, but we have 35 adolescents and very young adults who work with us on everything that we do from research to education, prevention, and even to our policy work. And this is incredibly important because who knows best about what's going on with young people than to ask young people themselves. All right, so let's get into the meat of this. So as you all probably know, we've been we've seen a huge change in the landscape of tobacco products. We've really gone from the cigarette in terms of young people, the cigarette to e-cigarettes or vaping. Now you're going to hear me mostly call them e-cigarettes or electronic cigarettes. They are actually not vapes, they're aerosolizers and they are really the term vape comes from the tobacco industry. It is their way of trying not to equate cigarettes with these products. But as I'm going to show you, they really are a form of cigarettes. So I prefer to call them e-cigarettes. However, when you're talking to teens, go ahead and call them vapes because that's what they do. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. So what are we talking about when we talk about e-cigarette or vaping products? We're talking about some of the pictures you see here, and I'm going to show you more pictures throughout this whole talk. But when you're looking here, e-cigarettes first came on the market in 2005. They came to the U.S. from China. And at first, if you can see my cursor moving at the top left, they look like cigarettes. We call that cigalikes. Well, e-cigarettes that look like cigarettes, teens were not using. Not a lot of adults were using either, but teens were not interested. They look like cigarettes. They kind of taste like cigarettes. They just weren't that interested. So when these first came on the market, we weren't real worried about e-cigarette use. In fact, I remember asking a colleague of mine when they first came out, should we be worried? And he said, no. And they're super expensive. Little did we know, you know, fast forward, uh, 10, 15 years, what we're going to be concerned about. So the next products that came on the market after the Sigalikes were these right here at the far uh, upper far right, more the vape pens. We're still seeing those. You press a button uh, on it to release the e-juice, the e-liquid e or nicotine liquid into your mouth. And they came in flavors. The first versions came in flavors as well, but not as many. These new ones came in flavors and they were rechargeable. Whereas the first generation, you throw them out when you're done. 
Then we had mods right here, the box style, or my friend calls them a chunky. These chunky box style, they could be modified in any way that you want. You can modify the coils, the amount of nicotine you're getting, the heat, all kinds of things. And these were rechargeable as well. So I would hear from schools around 2012, 2013 saying, oh, what's going on in my classroom? I'm seeing something plugged in to the classroom seems to be charging or parents would ask me about it. And they were earlier e-cigarettes. We saw teens uptick in these products, but not as much. We really didn't, and I'll show you this epidemiological data, but we really didn't start getting really concerned about e-cigarettes until Joel came on the market in 2015. And after that, we have a huge plethora of new, uh, Charlie and I were saying whack-a-mole, new products coming on the market all the time, not a lot of regulation. If we have time, we could talk about the FDA and, and state regulations around this. But from Juul, we had Soren, we have Puff Bars, we've got many other products. And I want you to be aware of what these look like. And I'm going to show you more pictures because you as parents need to be on the lookout because they don't look like cigarettes. They don't look like nicotine products. They look like household products. If you look back at this one, this looks like a highlighter, the Soren. These right here just look like a USB, just like Juul look like a USB. So you may not know what it is that your sons and daughters are using. So these also, the earlier versions, and to be honest, it's coming back, are we're seeing e-liquid or e-nicotine, or nicotine liquid, whatever you want to call them. These are dropper size bottles, like what you see in eye drops, uh, small bottles. And that's what in there is the e-liquid or the nicotine liquid that has nicotine and all kinds of other chemicals that I'm going to tell you about. These are what's used to drip into the mo mods, the box style, the earlier versions. But again, we're still seeing this on the market as well. So something else to be aware of if you see a product like this. Now, newer products that we've been concerned about, if you're seeing these, one is Puff Bar. If you look here, the green, it really does look like Juul, but Juul has a pod a little separate, separate piece that came off. So starting with Juul in 2015, instead of adding the e-liquid to it, they were self-contained. It was all together in the same device. It was the device and then this little pod, and I'll show you the pod in a few slides, that you could take out and then add a new pod in. After Juul, a couple years later, about three years later, Puff Bar came on the market, and this looks very similar to a Juul. In fact, the owners of Puff Bar even say that they are a Juul knockoff, but rather than have a separate pod, it's all in one piece. These are called disposables because when you are done, you don't recharge it, you don't add a new pod, you just throw it out. If we have time at the end, we could talk about the environmental harms around that. But then we also have Views. Flume is a really popular brand. If you see something like this, we see this a lot in California. I actually saw Flume right outside one of the Warriors games recently, just being sold on the streets. Hide, gotta love the name, Hide. Hmm, hiding from parents, right? Hide is another product that we're very concerned about right now that we're seeing. The other product that's very com uh, popular is Elf Bar. And this picture, by the way, was taken uh, by uh, us. I took it because schools collect uh, confiscated e-cigarette products and they give them to me. And this is what recently I was given with these products. And you can see the flume. You can see, I don't even know what half of these products are named. There, there are knockoffs, there are um, counterfeits coming from China. It's been a huge problem with influx of unregulated illegal e, um, e-cigarette e products. But the one that we're also concerned about is this Elf Bar here at the bottom. We're seeing Elf Bar a lot right now. So that's one, and it you can't tell what it is um, unless you know. So be on the lookout. And that's what it looks like up close. So let's talk about rates. So one of the things I want you to know it's important to know is the blue line here. These are data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey from 2011 to 2022. We don't have 23 numbers out yet. So these National Youth Tobacco Survey collected by the Centers for Disease Control, 
these uh, track adolescents' use of all kinds of tobacco products uh, ever and in the past 30 days. What you're looking here is the percentage of adolescents surveyed nationally who used an e-cigarette or a cigarette in the past 30 days. If you look at the blue line, you'll see the good news is that cigarette use has gone down dramatically. In fact, we're seeing well below 5% in California and across the country. That's the good news. But if you look at the red line, that is the sharp increase in the percentage of adolescents in the past 30 days who have reported to use an e-cigarette. And if you look, some people say, oh, and this is an important misperception, a lot of people say, oh, it's a good thing we have e-cigarettes because otherwise teens would be smoking cigarettes. That is not the case. It is not that teens are saying, hmm, do I, do I use a cigarette or an e-cigarette? Teens are saying, yuck, to, e -cig to cigarettes, excuse me, to cigarettes. They don't want to use cigarettes. We've gotten that message across. And if you look at the blue line, even starting in the year 2000, cigarette use has gone down pretty dramatically but e-cigarette use has gone up. They're not using it as a replacement product. It's a whole new way of addicting young people. And we'll talk more about reasons in a little bit. So the other thing I want you to look at is not only have the numbers overall gone up, but the percentage of adolescents who are using frequently, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, consider that to be 20 out of the past 30 days. As somebody who studies nicotine and nicotine dependence, addiction, I would say 20 out of 30 days, you're probably addicted. So we're seeing an increase in the percentage of adolescents who use e-cigarettes who are using them frequently. Oh, almost half of adolescents who have ever tried are using them pretty regularly. And daily in 2022, we're seeing about 12% of adolescents are using their e-cigarette daily. This is a huge percentage. We're talking about three and a half million, two and a half to three and a half million young people who are using an e-cigarette ever of in the past 30 days of whom about over a million, a million and a half adolescents right now are currently addicted to these products. And I would actually argue, and for those of you who are listening, who are teachers or who work in schools or know about the school rates, I would actually argue that the rates are even higher. I'm getting calls constantly from schools in California and across the country about the vaping epidemic and how concerned people are. And because of the pandemic, which is when a lot of these data were collected, young people were home, they weren't interacting. It's a very social event to start vaping that they weren't together and that the rates probably in 2022 were lower than what we're really seeing right now. So I would argue that is still very much a public health um, a public health issue. So let's talk about other vaping products. And I just saw a question about Zen. I can I can get to that at the end. Um, I took those pictures out in the interest of time, but I can find them and bring them in if we have time at the end. It's a great question. I will talk to you about it. Let's talk about other vaping or e-cigarette products. One of the other pieces or things that young people are, are using or vaping is THC, cannabis or CBD. And this is important to know. And I'll show you some pictures, but a lot of times it's really hard as a parent, as a healthcare provider, as a teacher to know, is the e-cigarette device nicotine or is it THC? Not only is it hard, we know that a lot of teens actually open their nicotine e-cigarette device open it up even though you're not supposed to. They'll, they'll, they'll vape or get rid of or inhale about half of the product. Then they'll open it up and add THC oil or wax to it. And then they get the double whammy of nicotine and THC and all the flavors that come with it. And that's been a big problem. So when you're talking to your, to your, to your children, make sure then when you're asking whether they're using it, we'll talk about how to approach your kids that you find out not only if they're vaping, but what is it that they're using and whether it's THC, CBD, um, nicotine, or some combination. But we also can vape a lot of other things. You can vape your caffeine. You can vape your vitamins. 
You can vape melatonin. And we're seeing this, and I didn't bring in the data, and most things, by the way, or everything I'm talking about, either we've published papers on in my lab or colleagues have, and I'd be happy if I show you my email at the end, happy to have you email me and I could show you the papers. But we're seeing an increase in the percentage of adolescents who are also using what we're calling non-nicotine e-cigarettes. So you can vape pretty much anything, and these are not regulated by any federal agency. E-cigarettes, nicotine e-cigarettes, are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products. Cannabis is regulated because it's Schedule 1. It's actually illegal at the federal level. These products are not regulated by anybody, and we're still seeing a lot of young people use. And we have a paper that we published that showed that teens start with these products and then move to nicotine e-cigarettes. So again, if you're talking to your kids, what are you using? It's important to find out if they're vaping, what specifically is in that vape? All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what's in e-cigarettes. This is our schemata to show you as these swipe in. Now I've been doing, um, embarrassingly, just to show my age, tobacco control work for about 25, 30 years. I used to show slides like this for cigarettes. Now, cigarettes may have thousands of scary ingredients, E-cigarettes may have hundreds, but they're still pretty scary. And just like cigarettes, e-cigarettes have, of course, nic nicotine, but they have acetone, acrylene, uh, formaldehyde, acetone, lead, and so on. And a lot of these, the yellow ones are on the FDA sort of most wanted list, the products that we're most concerned about. Now, what e-cigarettes have that cigarettes do not have is the propylene glycol and the glycerin. And that is used as an agent to bring the product in through your body, into your lungs, into your brain. Um, and those are kind of binding uh, agents and uh, sort of oily substances that bring it in. Cigarettes don't have that, but everything else pretty much is in a cigarette. So I like to show this as well, when, especially when we're talking to young people, forget all the crazy chemicals. Let's say, how do they relate to what we use in our everyday lives? Well, lead is in batteries. This is what people are inhaling. Nickel is in cheap jewelry. Tulene is a paint thinner. Benzene is actually gasoline. Um, nitrosamine is a, 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 sorry, is a pesticide. That's another product. I had to move my picture of you guys. Cadmium is in batteries. Formaldehyde, of course, as you know, dead tissue preservatives. Diacetyl, that's the buttery flavor the, that's in, in microwavable popcorn, for example. That And we'll talk about that more. That is another ingredient. And of course, nicotine. So e-cigarettes, and the aerosol that comes out from that big, it's not really smoke, it's aerosol in that big plume that contains nicotine, ultrafine particles, heavy metals, volatile organic, organic chemicals and compounds. And yes, secondhand smoke or vapor or aerosol is an issue. If you are next to somebody and they are using their e-cigarette and that puff goes into you, you are also getting a lot of these chemicals and ingredients into your lungs as well. So this is a picture that I took of an e-cigarette that was caught um, by a middle schooler using. And by the way, I didn't mention this in the slide where I showed rates. I should pause to tell you that you might be saying, oh, it's not my kid. Hopefully it's not. Or that's just the high school or that's just the bad kids. Mm. I hate to tell you, but right now, e-cigarettes are being used by all young people. I don't mean everyone, but doesn't matter, male or female, um, actually a little bit higher rates in trans youth and queer youth, but basically the same. Doesn't matter what race, ethnicity, doesn't matter if you have good grades or bad grades or in between grades. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter your income. We are seeing this as an equal opportunity problem right now. And it's not just high school. It's not just middle school. I didn't show you the rates on middle school. They're, they're certainly lower than high school, but they're about, but they're increasing and there's a similar pattern. But I am 
Susie, seen this in elementary school too. I've had parents in school talk to me about their third graders using e-cigarettes and they're getting it from their older siblings. They smell good, they taste good um, and they think that they're candy. So this is a problem that is starting very young. All right, let's talk about nicotine. I think it's really important to have a conversation about nicotine. So we all know, or hopefully you know, that nicotine is in cigarettes. Also, a pack of cigarettes has 20 cigarettes. Presumably you know that. Each cigarette has about eight milligrams of nicotine in it. But the actual yield, how much nicotine actually gets into your body, is about one to one and a half milligrams of nicotine per cigarette. Because they're actually not the most efficient. They're, they're the best way cigarettes to bring nicotine to your body, but they're still not super efficient. A lot of that nicotine and the other chemicals goes in the ashtray, goes on your fingers, goes in the air, on the floor, whatever. So if you were just to smoke an entire pack of cigarettes, you would inhale about 22, oh, that slide's not working. Sorry, it's supposed to show, but about 22, um, about 22 or 20 cigarettes about 22 milligrams of nicotine. Juul, when Juul came on the market in 2015, they had the biggest amount of volume of nicotine than any product we'd ever seen. It's a 59 milligram per milliliter volume, but Juul pot is about 0.7 milliliters. So just multiply 59 times 0.7, you get about 41 milligrams. And Juul, they took it off their website, but they used to brag that if you use um, the Juul pod, you get about 50, excuse me, about 80% of the product into your body. Yay, good news. Yeah, well, so if you were to use a Juul pod, you're getting about 40 milligrams of nicotine into your body. So you're getting about 37-ish cigarettes, more than a pack of cigarettes. Now, Juul would say it's one pack of cigarettes. I've had debates with healthcare providers and public health folks. Um, it's somewhere between one and two packs. Nobody knows for sure, but a Juul pot is about that much. Now I showed you Flume. That's a new um, product that we're seeing. It has 400 milligrams of nicotine. If you were to use this, you're getting about 360 cigarettes worth of nicotine in your body. Elf Bar, the product I said we're seeing a lot is almost 600. Now, not all at once, not all in one day, but they are huge volumes of products. Now, you might be saying, well, but how much are young people using? We don't know about the, the newer products, Flume or Elf Bar. We're actually going to launch a study on that. But Jewel Pods, we would talk to young people and they would say that they were using a pack a week, or excuse me, a pot a week, which is about two or three cigarettes a day worth of nicotine or a pod to four pods a day. That's one to eight packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine and chemicals per day for those young people who are most addicted. That is an incredibly dangerous amount of nicotine that people are using. Not only that, but these newer products have something called salt-based nicotine. If you've ever been a smoker, or maybe you still are and not judging at all, um, you, you may remember or, or have had the experience of that throat hit. I've never smoked. I've never used it. But everybody tells me this throat hit kind of caustic and strong in the back of the throat. The older e-cigarettes have that same kind of nicotine. It's a free-based nicotine. Free-based nicotine uses sugars and ammonia to bind and bring it through your body. What Juul patented in 2015, and now almost all the e-cigarette companies are using, is a salt-based nicotine. Salt-based nicotine uses salts in the form of benzoic acid to now move the needle. Think about litmus test. We did a little math, now we'll do a little chemistry. Think about the litmus test. In the litmus test, it, if you look at the basic side, that's where the free base nicotine sat. It's very basic, very caustic. What happens with the salt base is it moves more towards the acidic side, but really towards neutral, becomes more neutralized. So it is now a very smooth product. Young people don't cough. They don't have that throat hit and it's absorbed faster. And therefore what thinking is and the science is showing that it is absorbed more readily. 
This is important because most adolescents now are starting nicotine and tobacco through e-cigarettes, not through cigarettes. So they don't want that caustic feeling. If if they pick up a cigarette, say that's gross. I don't like it. I cough. I throw up. I ew. same with the old cigarettes. But starting with Juul and continuing now, the newer products with the salt base, it's smooth. They like it and they don't mind using it. So that's important to know. Um, I promise I will get to where they're getting it and the cost. Good questions. I've got you covered. All right. So why are we concerned? Well, if, I've, if I haven't convinced you enough while we're concerned about e-cigarettes, let me tell you more. First of all, the brain I go in, um, and the heart and trouble breathing. So let me talk a little bit more about this. We know that adolescents' brains continue to develop until they're about age 25, all right? So anything we put into our brains before 25, THC, nicotine, any other drug makes us significantly more likely to become addicted. Our brains are changing during this time. Our brains are, we're basically born with the ability to become addicted and addicted to nicotine. We have the nicotinic receptors when we're born. But if we don't put any nicotine into our bodies, if we don't use nicotine, our body says, ah, you don't need that receptor. It prunes it away, it gets rid of it. Same thing with, I can't roll my R's in language, the small phonemes, language sounds, because it never got reinforced when I was a child, but I was born with that ability to roll my R's. You all were, but unless you have it reinforced, you lose that ability. It's the same thing with our brains during adolescence. If we don't use part of that brain or need that receptor, that dopamine receptor that we see, that, that pleasure receptor, then we get rid of it. That is why it's so incredibly, incredibly important to keep young people away from the, these products until at least 25. Now, I don't mean at age 25, go have a good time. It's never good for you. Still bad for your lungs, your heart, everything else we'll talk about in a minute. But in terms of nicotine addiction, we're a lot less likely to become addicted after that 25, 26 age range. So and we know because 90% of adults who are addicted to any form of nicotine started when they were younger. They started in high school or in under the age of 21 usually, but certainly under the age of 25. So because of our brains developing, it's so incredibly important that we keep young people safe. Now, when I talk to young people, when you talk to your children, the message is not you're, you're dumb and your brains are, are still developing and you don't know what you're doing until you're age 25. That message was actually sadly given to my older daughter, who's now 27. Um, and it, it, I remember Brianne came home in ninth grade and said, I'm stupid. Everybody said our brain's not working. Well, she's an incredibly gifted young person. Well, no longer a young adult, a full-on adult, incredibly gifted. And the message was wrong. The message was your brain's not developing and therefore you're stupid. I always tell my own kids and I tell um, young people, the fact that your brains are still developing is why you're so cool. You have the whole world in front of you. You're figuring out what it is that you want to do. You know, how many times have your kids come to you and say, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know who I am. I'm trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Check, check, check. That's what they should be asking. They're figuring it out. That's what makes them cool. It's why they can learn language better. It's why they're more creative, why they enjoy dance and all the things that we as we get older may not enjoy or be as capable of it. That's the cool part for young people. But because of that, at the same time, their brains are looking for what to keep and not keep in terms of uh, the nicotine or THC receptors and why we have to protect young people. Okay, so now let's talk about the lungs. Tobacco in any form, whether we're talking about smoked or vaped or any, any inhaled form, and this is true for THC cannabis as well, Anything you inhale, same thing with smoke during our fires, right? I have asthma. It's terrible when we have fires. Causes inflammation and irritation of the airways. Also can destroy, particularly the tobacco smoke or aerosol, can destroy the air sacs that are in the lungs. Also, when we're using uh, any form of inhaled tobacco nicotine, we get a weaker immune response to infection. 
ask. And this is why actually I've talked to some healthcare providers who say that they don't want to perform um, surgery or do any elective procedures on somebody who's vaping or smoking, even young people, because they're worried about their ability to heal. So pulmonary effects, more lungs. So e-cigarettes also have flavors in them. And I'm going to talk about the flavors more detail in a minute. But those flavors are associated with lung illness in and of themselves. It does not have to be the nicotine, just the flavors, just the propylene glycol, just the glycerin, those. And this is important because I've heard a lot of young people say, oh, I'm just vaping um, harmless water vapor, or I'm just using harmless uh, heated water. It's nothing to worry about. Mm. First of all, they're probably using THC or nicotine, um, but they may not be. And if they are using essential oils or vitamins or whatever, I'm worried about it, not because the vitamin, I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about the melatonin. I'm worried about the inhaling something that is hot and how that goes into our body. So we know that any form of e-cigarettes can cause lung damage. The flavors, there's diacetyl. I mentioned that earlier. That's a buttery flavor that we tend to see in microwavable popcorn. The federal government has a term grass, generally recognized as safe. You can eat, um, you can eat butter and heat it up really high and eat it. it. Might burn your tongue, but you can do that. You can heat cinnamon or vanilla or other flavors. But if you heat them and then inhale the aerosol, that causes lung lesions and is very harmful to our bodies. And smoking and vaping in COVID, this is something else. So we know, as I showed you that the lungs are weakened from breathing in smoke or aerosol. We know that the novel coronavirus attacks the lungs. So it stands to reason that if you are um, using with smoking or vaping, that you're more likely to get COVID or be, um, or, or have a severe infection of COVID. We did a study in 2020, May of 2020, just a few months, couple months after the shutdown. And we asked adolescents and young adults whether or not they were vaping, um, whether or not they were smoking, and then whether they had ever had been diagnosed with COVID. And we saw a significant relationship, not causal, but a correlative relationship between smoking, vaping, and getting presence or absence of COVID. Now, in this case, I don't know if it's the lungs. We're not sure. It could very well be the sharing. Remember, I said e-cigarettes are very much a social event, particularly for young people. Even when young people were locked inside, they were going outside in the backyard. They were hanging out. They're probably friends were coming by. You may or may not knew, know that. It's hard to know. And they were sharing their vaping products. And plus taking your mask off to be able to vape or going out to a store to be able to buy your tobacco products. And so we think that that's a lot of why we saw this very significant relationship between smoking, vaping, and covid and I have a friend who did a study uh, They were interviewing young people who said, oh, no, 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 don't worry. During the pandemic, we were standing six feet apart and then sharing our vapes. And you're going, oh, let's talk about public health, please. So that's one of the things we're very concerned about. We also know that adolescents who use e-cigarettes are four times more likely to then go on and use cigarettes. My little bridge here. So that's the other thing that we're concerned about. And if you use cigarettes, you then are, you know, in for the a whole host of other concerns there. So why is it that young people are using these products? There are a lot of different reasons. And this is uh, for the audience. Soon we're going to get to a pop quiz. So get ready to play along. These are just some of the reasons and I'll go through them. So let's talk about flavors. If you would, while I'm talking the next couple of slides, put in the chat or or in the Q&A, uh, probably in the chat, put in the chat, it'll be easier. Um, so the parent venture folks don't get confused. Put in the chat, how many flavors of e-cigarettes do you think have been in the mar on the market in total? Not just Jewel or Flume or anything, but in total, how many flavors do you think there have been on the market? Keep going and we'll talk. So why flavors? Well, we know that flavors mask the harsh taste and smell of tobacco. Look, if it smells like tobacco, tastes like tobacco, We've taught teens that that's a bad thing and it's gross and, and they don't want to use it. So flavors are now good. 
flavors make young, they're not good, but flavors make young people think that it's good. If it tastes good, smells good, it must be okay. In many, many studies, including ours and others, youth say that they're interested in trying tobacco because it's flavored. Youth report that they would quit if the flavors were not available. They tell us that the ads and the packaging of flavored tobacco products are appealing to youth. And you say that they'll look for products and flavors in any product. So they'll switch to a product that has the flavors that they want. So here are some flavors. Let me see what you all wrote. 800 in the market. Oh, Margaret, you're going to get the gold star. I love it. Oh, Gene, 10,000 thousands. Oh, Amy, 5 million. Not quite, but uh, not too bad. All right, a lot of, all right, you guys are actually pretty close as a group. I'm impressed. All right, ready? There are over 15,000 flavors that have been on the market. Now, when you look at this, um, and when when I've, I've been studying e-cigarettes since they first came on the market, in, in well, not quite 2005, maybe around 2007, and there was a question of, well, why are these in flavors and the e-cigarette industry would say, we need flavors to help adults quit smoking. If we have time, we can talk about whether they, well, I'll tell you now, there's not good data that e-cigarettes help adults quit cigarette smoking. But even if they did, we don't need flavors like honey doo doo, dragon's blood, sugar booger, unicorn poop. Those flavors are not for adults. I don't know about you, I don't want those flavors. They're not for adults. They are attracting our young people. And this has been one of the concerns. Now, um, actually, let me go back there. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of uh, Senate Bill 793, or you may remember a year ago when we voted Prop 31. I think it was a year ago, Prop 31. Um, uh, I was going around campaigning for Prop 31, I admit, and uh, wanted a yes vote. I testified on behalf of Senate Bill 793, what are these? These were the policies to get flavored tobacco products, not just e-cigarettes, all flavored tobacco products with a few exceptions, um, not allowed in California. And it passed. So right now in California, with the exception of hookah, um, big cigars, and, a, and loose, leaf toba loose, loose leaf tobacco, you are not allowed to have or sell flavored tobacco. Now that's great, really excited. But if you think about the slide, I, didn't, I won't bore you with going backwards, but the slide on, that I showed you of the products that were confiscated from schools, that was just a couple months ago. So even though we have this ban, enforcement has been a huge issue. Young people and adults are still getting flavored tobacco products in stores, online, um, from behind the counters illegally and so on. So I would say for you, if you're seeing young people with flavored vapes, report it because this is an enforcement issue. And in, in fact, there was a store in Alameda County that or a store or company that was still selling, even after many, many warning labels from the attorney general's office, selling flavored vapes that um, they got sued. And I, I, I'm happy to report was involved in that and was able to write a declaration to explain why we need to get these off the market. And uh, and, and the attorney's general office won and the, that story, I don't know if the store got closed down, but basically they were fined and not allowed to be selling the flavored vapes. So really a serious issue that we need to be aware of. All right. Uh, um, you can report it to the, to the San Mateo Department of Public Health or to a police station, if you're seeing it, school resource or wherever you live, school resource officers can help you report it as well. At the federal level, the FDA actually has a place, I have to find it again if you email me, but has a way to report bad businesses and bad companies as well. So there are ways to do it and I would. All right, easy to hide, another pop quiz. Take a peek quickly and count and put in how many e-cigarettes do you see each in there in this picture while I take a sip of water. Anybody want to take a guess? We have one brave soul. Eight, eight. Ooh, 22. 10. All right. Getting some good numbers. You ready for the answer? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 
I always forget. Um, here's one here, an e-cigarette. Here's the flume and the um, elf bar, not that hard to see. Put this here as elf bar to show that it looks, you know, it could be confused with mango peach gel. Um, this is your uh, USB style. This right here is another one. Here's one. And then you've got a vape pen that looks like a pen, another USB style. All right. This is no accident. These are made this way so that way young people can hide them from you. Now look at this. This is the newest e-cigarette that we've been seeing. It's called High Light. You like that play on words. It is a high lighter. It actually works, but it's also a vape. We are seeing this all the time right now. So oh, um, it, it's hard parents. It is hard. I'm not necessarily saying that you, well, you may want to go into your kid's backpack. I'm not necessarily saying that you take every highlighter and test to see if it works, but you got to be vigilant. You got to pay attention as much as you can to what your young people are bringing home, what they're using, what's in their room, what's in their backpacks. These are all over the place. So incredibly ubiquitous. They're in Hello Kitty. They're in Star Wars designs. They're, they're watches. Um, they, they look like everything possible and young people are hiding them. And it, what they're doing is they're using it in school and then blowing the, the aerosol or smoke into their into their uh, jackets, into their hoodies. Um, and so, and again, they smell good. I often tell parents, if your kid's room smells like blueberries, strawberries, mango, it may not be a fruit salad. It might be that they're using these products. So being vigilant. And by the way, I'm not blaming you parents, by the way, I am not. I know this is hard. I blame the industry. I blame the tobacco companies. It's why I've been dedicated in the last few years to working with lawyers, policymakers, and others to really get um, at the federal city state level to get these products off, off the market. I am not blaming you. I am not even blaming young people, but I am just saying that we have to be as vigilant as we can be, which is not easy. These are the jewel pods. Um, and just to show you that they look like right here, the yellow is the benzoic acid. These are so small. They're the size of a quarter and a small paper clip. I've had parents say that they didn't even know their kid was using until these covers to it, the pod covers came out in the laundry. Right, marketing, just a few more minutes and I'll get to the questions. See so some of the marketing, you know, do, do I need to say more? They do. They, this is not marketing to adults. This is marketing to kids. And I can do an entire hour just on marketing. Access the question that was there. All right. Pop quiz. What's the legal age to purchase tobacco in California and um, across the U.S.? All right, let's see what we're getting. 2118. No, most of you are getting it. Oh, a few 18s. All right, ready? It is 21. So California, congratulations, California, went to what we call T21 or Tobacco 21 in 2016. In the US, it became a law of the land in December of 2019. I think it went into effect in January of 2020, but it became signed into law in December of 2019. You have to be age 21. Now, why do I say this? Why is this so incredibly important? We still have young, first of all, you all didn't know that. Again, not blaming you. We've not done a good job getting the word out. I really want to work on that. Uh, healthcare providers don't know it. Parents don't know it. Stores don't know it. They're supposed to, but they don't. Um, we have teachers don't know it. Young people don't know it. We have so many young people who are still accessing these products under 21. When you see something like this that says student discounts, you know, if you think about college ends when you're about 22, right? The majority of students, unless you're crazy like me and stayed in school forever, the majority of students are under the age of 21. So when you advertise student discounts, real picture in the Bay Area, you are advertising to our young people. This, this has to stop. We need to report more and more. So it's not that hard. You say, how are they accessing it? Unfortunately, I live in San Mateo. I've had parents tell me that the local vacant shops are selling to 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds. Um, 
This has been a big problem. They're also cheap, really cheap. A pack of cigarettes is about $10, including the taxes in California. Puff Bar, which remember has as much nicotine as at least one pack of cigarettes, if not two, is a dollar to two fifty. Jewel, the device itself was expensive, but the pod itself, once you have the device, you just buy pods, five dollars a pod, one to two packs of cigarettes right there, half the cost. The other products are also just as cheap, and there are coupons and other things that are enticing young people. It's a huge problem. Misperceptions, young people, and honestly, adults, hopefully you've learned something. I've corrected some of your misperceptions. Think that e-cigarettes are less risky and less addictive than other tobacco products. Now, yes, e-cigarettes are probably a little bit less um, risky than cigarettes, but not that much. And when it comes to heart issues, there's not. it's not clear that e-cigarettes cause cancer. Although my husband's an oncologist and he said, eh, I'm not so sure about that, given the amount of nicotine and aldehydes that are in there. But, but we haven't seen cases yet. We're not really sure. But remember, it took 50 years to figure out cancer in cigarettes. But e-cigarettes, clear evidence around lung and heart disease, clear evidence about nicotine, if nothing else, even more nicotine and more harmful nicotine. And as my friend from the CDC used to say, you could jump from a 10-story building or a 15-story building the effects are still the same. These are not harmless. They are harmful. And then ending with stress here, and then I'll do a little summary of resources, stress. Young people are incredibly stressed right now. I know that we're so caught out of the pandemic. The later, latest data from the, the national data show that about 40 to 50% of young people are reporting stress, depression, and about a third are reporting suicidality incredibly stressful times right now. We're stressed as adults, but are particularly young people. So in summary, what are we talking about? We have stealth youth-focused products that are continuously evolving. So we were saying earlier, whack-a-mole, as soon as I wrote a paper saying that young people are using Juul and pod-based products, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, regulated then those kinds of products. They, they said only those that are not targeting young people that are tobacco or menthol flavored can stay on the market. What happened? The market opened up to disposables. Those were not touched by the FDA. And suddenly we have a whole new market of products, vaping products that are out there for young people to use. It is nonstop and all the time out there. And there was the question about Zin. Zin, uh, toothpaste, Picks, suckers, gums are out there, Lucy gum, not to help young people stop using cigarettes. No, they're entry points to nicotine. And we're seeing young people using these products all the time. We have a paper we publish. These products have very high nicotine levels, as I told you, anywhere from one to two or three packs of cigarettes in one device. They have salt-based nicotine that has less throat hit, easier to use, easier to become addicted. Lots and lots of misperceptions around nicotine and the harms of these e-cigarettes. Probably you had misperceptions and many others. Flavors, they come in flavors. Even in California with these flavor bands, we're still seeing flavors. The packaging and the ads are clearly attracting our young people. They're cheap and they're harmful. Youth want to quit. Young people know, so we need to have resources. So what can you do? First, talk to your, your young people. Maybe they're listening with you now. If not, say, I just heard a talk on this. Don't accuse your young people. Have a conversation. What do you know about e-cigarettes? What do you call them? Can we have a conversation about it? And start that conversation. Talk with a healthcare provider about ways to help your children quit. If your kids are using, we need to help them. We're not... I would be upset if my kids were using, but right now it's not the time to get mad. It's the time to help them. And if you're using e-cigarettes or cigarettes, keep them away from the younger kids in particular, especially elementary school kids and pets because they are harmful and we're seeing poison, kids poisoned from these high doses of nicotine. So start that conversation. The conversation is not 
we have to have a lecture tonight or tomorrow at three o'clock, we're going to sit down and talk. That doesn't work. Find the opportunity to have the conversation again. Hey, you know, Johnny, I went to a talk today, tonight, and I want to ask you what you know about it. It's, it's not, we need to talk, but what do you think about Please don't say you don't use it, right? Because if they are, what are they going to do? Say, actually, I do. And then they're going to disappoint you. Have that conversation be open. Use vaping, drooling, puffing. I don't care how you have the conversation. Text, email, you Snapchat, a note under their door. Get through to them and have this conversation today. And by the way, if your son or daughter or child, children are coughing and, re, and a lot of headaches, could be COVID, could be the flu, it could be a cold, it could also be issues related to vaping and lung issues, get them into a doctor right away. So let's quickly talk about some resources. There are resources to help young people quit. Um, the, the ones that are here, some of them, uh, the Truth Initiative has a good one, This Is Quitting. There are others from the American Lung Association and the Surgeon General. There are hotlines. In addition to your healthcare provider, there are hotlines and resources available. I will tell you, uh, hopefully the QR code works. These are our curriculums and, and resources. I do not charge for these, but there are curriculums available. And just really quickly, um, we have, oops, I'm going to skip that. We have our tobacco prevention toolkit and our cannabis prevention toolkit. These are mostly for schools. But you as parents can also go online and use these curriculums to have a conversation with your children. We have safety first. This is not just tobacco or cannabis. This is all drugs, including fentanyl. It's a harm reduction approach of best if you don't use, but if you are, let's, let's help you be the safest possible. And then we've got healthy futures. If your children are using, you can assign this to them. It's Healthy Futures. It's for those who are using and or want to quit. And it goes through costs and mental health issues and, and motivation to help them quit. So we encourage you to use them. Also on our website, and I think Bev put it on early on, we have lots of fact sheets. This is one on the non-nicotine e-cigarettes um, that we have, but we have lots of fact sheets, tons of information. We have a parent corner and a youth corner, and we encourage you to use Please feel free to follow us on social media. We push out all kinds of advocacy opportunities, new research and curriculums. And thank you. And um, I, sorry, I didn't leave a huge amount of time, but I can say a couple minutes um, and answer as many questions as I can. Thank you. Oh, thank you, me. Dr. Bonnie Halpern felcher Hey, do you are you able to put that QR code back up or are the slides gone, gone? No, I can. Let me share. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. There you go. Grab it. grab it now. Then you can sign up for resources and training from Dr. Halpern Felsher's Reach Lab at Stanford. Okay. Um, so, Bonnie, a lot of questions about where do kids get these things? Do they go to 7 Eleven? Can you go to Safeway? If yes. they're not buying nicotine until they're 21, how do they buy them? I'm going to stop sharing if that's okay. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So uh, we're not seeing them as much as uh, not at pharmacies, thankfully, CVS, Rite Aid. CVS was the first to take e-cigarettes off the market. We're not seeing their gas stations are still selling them. Vape shops, your local vape, CBD, THC uh, shops are selling. And again, it's um, supposed to be illegal for under 21, but we're still seeing it happening. And that's a big problem. So, and also on online, they're buying it online. There's a law at the federal level that says that you cannot uh, mail e-cigarettes through the U.S. Postal Service. Mm, still seeing it happening all the time. So again, Bonnie, you do this work, you've been doing it for decades, but as you say, products keep coming in, even though laws have been passed. What should parents do to sort of support the whole, what can we do to stop this issue? What do you suggest we do? It's a great question. So there are a few things. First of all, there's Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. You can join them. They're a really good vaping advocacy group. Um, my lab does a lot of this work as well. If you're interested, email me. Um, we'll put you on a listserv. 
follow us on social media. There are lots of opportunities like Senate Bill 793 or um, the flavor ban, or we now actually are trying to support a cannabis flavor ban. There's lots of enforcement that can happen. Um, there are lots of opportunities at the state and federal level. And so we are super um you know, uh, active. And if you join us and follow us, we'll have lots and lots of opportunities to write letters to the FDA and basically say, come on, what are you doing to protect our kids, which is what we often do. So I'm happy to have those conversations with you all. Okay, thank you for that. What about a parent asks, is there any way to tell if you find a product that your kid may have brought home? What's in it? Do you know if it's nicotine or do you actually have to ask? Is there any way? I don't think it's stamped nicotine or CBD. So it's not usually T. Sometimes the THC, the THC vapes tend to be more metal or glass. Mm -hmm. And for those, um, sometimes they have a little leaf, the, the cannabis leaf, but you can't always tell. Um, sometimes you can tell by smelling it. Um, but you you can't always tell, especially if a young person is opening it and putting in their own products. So ask. Some, sometimes a police officer can tell when they can test it. Um, but the biggest is to ask, to look at it, to ask to see the package that it comes in. Unfortunately, when we do our research and we ask young people what flavors, what nicotine, what's in it, they don't even know because they're sharing their products. Wow. Well, listen, we have come to the end of our hour here, but Dr. Halpern Felscher, this has been amazing. I think, are there any other questions there, Bonnie, that you want to answer quickly? Just really quickly, the second hand I mentioned quickly, but there are secondhand effects. All the things that are in that aerosol come out and get into you. Um, there was a question about Puff. Puff, I think, is not selling nicotine anymore. I think they're only selling synthetic and THC. Um, there are THC disposables. And Millie, um, I'm not sure what specifically you meant for the data sources. If you email me, I can send you that information. So I think I got through it all. I think you did. All right. Well, listen, this is obviously a topic that is important to us. We're going to keep covering it. But Dr. Halpern Felschers, as she said, these resources online to reach lab are free. Parents do check them out. We are so grateful to you and the work that you do. Dr. Halper and Felscher, thank you, thank you for tonight, and we really appreciate you. Again, Bonnie is here as part of her community service. I just want you all to know that. So thank you, everybody. Take care. We hope to see you again soon. Good night.